Hi there! Welcome back to video number three in our four-part series on genetics, helping you to become masters of genetics. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we have two other videos, and you should watch them and then come back here. If you're here, I'm assuming you've already seen our first two videos and that you understand all of the following terms. DNA, genes, alleles, chromosomes, diploid, haploid, meiosis, gametes like sperm and eggs, zygotes, homozygous, heterozygous, phenotype, genotype, dominant, recessive, incomplete dominant, co-dominant, that you understand all of that. Good? We good? Got all that? Giddy up. If you don't know what I'm talking about, of course, we've got these two videos. You should watch both of them and come back here. If you've already seen those videos, then you're in the right place. And, and hopefully, you are waiting for the answer to the question that you answered after the last video. Okay, that question was, knowing that the wild type allele and the leucistic allele show a blended phenotype called lesser, the leucistic allele is A, dominant to the wild type allele, B, recessive to the wild type allele, C, co-dominant with the wild type allele, or D, incomplete dominant with the wild type allele. So let's go through this one option at a time. If it were dominant, the heterozygous lesser would look just like the homozygous leucistic ball python. It doesn't. If it were recessive, the heterozygous lesser would look just like the homozygous wild type normal ball python. It does not. If it were co-dominant, the heterozygous lesser would have patches that look like the wild type ball python and patches that look like the leucistic ball python. It does not. If it were incomplete dominant, the heterozygous lesser would not look like a normal wild type ball python or a leucistic ball python on any part of its body, but something in between. And it does. So the correct answer is D. The leucistic allele is incomplete dominant with the wild type allele. That brings us to a new question. Because a lesser ball python is a heterozygote, it has one allele that codes for a wild type ball python and another allele that codes for a leucistic ball python. Because both parents have both alleles, is it possible if two lesser ball pythons breed that they could produce babies with the wild type phenotype, babies with the lesser phenotype, and babies with the leucistic phenotype? And can we predict what percent should be wild type what percent should be lessers and what percent should be leucistics? You bet we can, but we will probably need to write it down or make a drawing. Because we have probably no idea what the DNA actually looks like for each of these different alleles, when we write them down or make a drawing, we usually use letters to represent them. For dominant alleles, we use capital letters like capital A, capital B, capital C, capital D, you're probably familiar with letters. It doesn't matter which letter we use, it only matters that it is capital. For an allele that is recessive, we use a lowercase version of the same letter that we used for the dominant allele. If we used a capital A for the dominant allele, we would use a lowercase a to represent the recessive allele. If the alleles are incomplete dominant or co-dominant to each other, then neither allele is recessive. Thus, we represent both alleles as capital letters. To show that they are alleles for the same trait, we even use the same capital letter to represent them. For example, we might represent both letters with a capital D. The only problem with this is that they would both look the same on paper, but they aren't really the same. Because they aren't the same, we need some way to distinguish between them. Going back to our calico cat example from the last video, we might represent both the black allele and the orange allele with a capital R. The letter is arbitrary though. But to keep them straight, I might represent the orange allele like this, where the little O next to the R tells me that it's the orange allele. And the black allele like this, where the little B next to the R shows me that it's the black allele. To review, dominant alleles are represented by a capital letter. 
and recessive alleles are represented by the same letter, but lowercase. Codominant alleles, or incomplete dominant alleles, are both represented by the same letter, and they will both be represented by the same capital letter. We use different superscripts to distinguish between them. So, knowing that a lesser ball python is a heterozygote that shows an incomplete dominant phenotype, meaning that it shows a phenotype that is halfway between a wild-type phenotype and a leucistic phenotype, how would you represent the genotype of a lesser ball python? Take a moment to write down your answer while I stare at this snake. All right, so you got that? If I pick to use the capital letter A to represent this particular gene, I would represent the genotype of this snake as capital A with maybe a little superscript L, capital A with a superscript W, where the little L tells me that that's the leucistic allele, and the little W tells me that that's the wild type allele. Since we know the genotypes of the parents, a lot of people would start drawing some boxes called a Punnett square. Don't do this. People know to make some boxes and put the letters on the sides, but they don't know what the letters mean or which letters go where, and so they make a lot of mistakes, so just don't do that. What we really need to do next is think about the type of gametes, the sperm or the eggs, that our two snakes could make. Because each snake has two different alleles, but they can only give one to each of their gametes, they can make two different kinds of gametes. Meiosis splits the chromosomes up. Thus, each gamete will contain either an A with a little L, leucistic allele, or an A with a little W, wild type allele. Just like when you flip a coin, the odds of getting one of those two options are not better than the odds of getting the other. Meiosis is brainless. It does not know if the alleles are dominant, recessive, incomplete dominant, or codominant. It just divides them up and gives one to half of the gametes and the other one to the other half of the gametes. Thus, you are just as likely to get a leucistic allele from one of the parents as you are to get a wild type allele from that parent. So in our case, our male lesser can produce either sperm with a leucistic allele or sperm with a wild type allele. He produces just as much wild type sperm as he does leucistic sperm. And both are equally likely to be passed on to his offspring. Our female lesser is no different except she makes eggs instead of sperm. She can make either an egg with a wild type allele or an egg with a leucistic allele, and both are equally likely to be passed on to her offspring. To figure out all the possible genotypes that their babies could have, and in what ratios, you need to make a little matrix, like this, where you put all of the types of sperm that the male can make on one axis and all of the types of eggs that the female can make on the other. You can see that I drew these as eggs and sperm and I put the little tails on the sperm and you darn well better put those ding-dang tails on the sperm or you will forget what they are. If they got the tails on them, you will never forget what they are and no one will. You can see that I have the sperm that the male can make on top and the eggs that the female can make on the side. It doesn't matter which parent goes on which side of the matrix, as long as you get all of the types of gametes that one parent can make on one side and all of the types that the other parent can make on the other side. Once you get the parents set up, you can fill in the matrix with all of the different genotypes that that male's sperm and that female's eggs can produce together. Your final matrix should look like this. You can see that for each zygote, I started with the egg that formed the zygote and then the sperm. Hopefully the colors and arrows make that make a little more sense. I ended up with the complete diploid genotype of each type of zygote they could produce. Now we need to look at what we have. To do this, we need to count, of the possibilities, how many show each genotype. There are three different possible genotypes here. We can make zygotes that are homozygous for the leucistic allele, zygotes that are heterozygous, and zygotes that are homozygous for the wild type allele. Looking at our matrix, of the four possibilities, only one is homozygous for the leucistic allele. That means that per zygote, we have a one in four, one fourth chance of producing a leucistic. Of the four possibilities, two are heterozygotes. That means that per zygote we have a two in four or one half chance of producing a lesser. And of the four possibilities, only one is homozygous for the wild type allele, meaning we have a one in four chance of producing a wild type individual. 
and these are the odds per zygote or per egg laid. This doesn't mean that we will always get four eggs or that these are the exact ratios we would get if we did. But each egg that is laid has a 50% chance of being a lesser, a 25% chance of being a wild type, and a 25% chance of being a leucistic. So that is what happens if we cross two snakes that are both heterozygous for the same thing. But what if they aren't? For example, what if I have a male lesser and a female pied? When we were talking about two lessers, we were talking about two alleles that occur on the same chromosome. When genes occur on the same chromosome, they are called allelic. Technically, to be allelic, they need to occur on the same relative position of the chromosome, but that is way outside of what we're gonna worry about in these videos. Mojave, Mystic, and Special, for example, are all allelic with lesser. They all occur on the same chromosome. The genotype of an individual that is heterozygous for the lesser leucistic gene and the Mojave leucistic gene might look pretty much like this. This snake would not possess any wild type alleles and therefore it would pass on one of the two leucistic alleles to each one of its offspring. We often call a group of alleles that are all allelic with one another a gene complex. Lesser and pied, however, are not allelic. What this means is that when I'm doing crosses, I need to look at the two traits separately. For the chromosome where lesser is located, the pied is basically just a homozygous wild type. Thus, we will need to make a separate matrix for each trait. And what happens with one has no influence on what happens with the other. When I make my matrix for the lesser trait, it would look like this. Each baby would have a 50% chance of receiving one copy of the leucistic allele, or lesser, and a 50% chance of receiving two copies of the wild type allele and being a normal, a wild type. And when I make my matrix for the pied trait, it would look like this. Since the pied was homozygous for the trait, all of the babies will get a single copy of the allele. You may be wondering how I knew that the pied was homozygous. Remember that piebald is a recessive trait. Because of this, a heterozygote wouldn't be a pied. Because it is a pied, it must be a homozygote for the pied allele. Because the babies aren't homozygotes, they won't show the trait in their phenotypes, but they are carriers. They're what you would call 100% het, or heterozygous for the trait. But to really understand hets and what to do with multi-gene crosses, you're gonna need to watch our next video. To review, to figure out the possible types of offspring that can be produced, you need to know the genotypes of the parents. With incomplete dominant or co-dominant traits, the genotype can be determined by looking at the phenotype. Individuals that show a recessive phenotype have to have a homozygous genotype. Once you know the genotypes of the parents, you need to make a matrix. Put all the kinds of gametes, sperm or eggs, that one parent can make on one axis, and all the types of gametes that the other parent can make on the other axis. Figure out all the possible genotypes for the zygotes that they can produce. Once you know the genotypes, you can figure out the phenotypes that those genotypes would create. Divide the total number of each genotype by the total number of genotypes possible to get the ratio or percentage. You can do the same thing for the phenotypes. If the traits are not allelic, which is often the case, assume that the other parent is homozygous wild type for the morphs it doesn't show. Now that you know this, it's time to put your knowledge to the test. If you can answer these questions, you've got it. Piebald is a recessive trait in ball pythons. If a heterozygous for piebald female, so not a piebald, but a heterozygous for piebald female, breeds with a male that is also heterozygous for piebald, what are the possible genotypes that their offspring can possess? So once again, piebald is recessive, and if you have two individuals that are both heterozygous for piebald and they breed, what are the possible genotypes that their offspring can possess? For each zygote, what are the odds for each possible genotype? What are the possible phenotypes coded for by those genotypes? For each zygote, what are the odds of each possible phenotype? Okay, write that question down because we've got another one. Leopard is a dominant trait in ball pythons. Leopard is not allelic with piebald. If a male that is heterozygous for the leopard trait and also heterozygous for the piebald trait breeds with a female that is heterozygous for the piebald trait but does not show the leopard phenotype, what are the odds that the babies will show the leopard phenotype? So once again, if I've got a male that's heterozygous for leopard and heterozygous for pied, and he breeds with a female that is heterozygous for pied, but 
doesn't have the leopard allele at all, what are the odds that the babies will show the leopard phenotype? And then, what are the odds that the babies will show the piebald phenotype? Like I said, if you can answer these questions, then you've got it. If you can't quite answer those questions, review this video again. And make sure you try, make sure you get an answer and you have it written down before you watch our next video. And then, watch our next video. As always, like and subscribe. We hope to see you real soon. Ding ding, ding ding, ding ding. I thought you were sneezing your beard onto your face or something. <laughs> 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 it's never happened before. Outrageous. Look, oh, they're exactly. spooning. That's Oops. a crazy spoon. Look at that.